But if there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics. Most golds, Rowdy, by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Mark Davis looks like he's going to win it. And Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Ultimate Swimmer podcast show. I am super excited about this week's guest because he's an 11-time national champion, and he's the American record holder in the 200 breaststroke with a crazy alien fast 147.9. And most importantly, he's the fastest man ever from El Paso, Texas. That's right. El Paso, Texas. You heard it here. And uh, multi-time national champion for the University of Texas Longhorns, leading him to several team titles Please welcome to the show for the first time, Will Lacone. Welcome, Will. Thank you for having me. Really excited for this and excited to be doing it with you. So I don't think it can get much better than that. (laughs) Well, we're we're Texas Longhorn brothers, and um, it's I loved getting to call your races at conference when I got to be the commentator for the Big Twelve races because you dominated each year for the Big Twelve and helping the team win the Big Twelve titles, and then you just had an epic college career for Texas, which we'll talk about at NC2As, talk about later. But I'm just fascinated with with you, you know, growing up in El Paso, Texas, not really a super hotbed for swimming. And so I wonder if you could kind of give us a little insight on what it was like growing up in El Paso. And I'm I'm a huge fan of your family. Uh, I've gotten to get to know your parents and your siblings, and they're just awesome. Um, So maybe you could just share with us some significant things about your childhood and uh, what your parents or coaches did in your foundational years. Yeah, definitely. You know, it's not the traditional route that I feel like a lot of people who grow up in the state of Texas who go on to go swim at a big D1 college kind of, it's not really the route that they go through, but uh, it's been unique in so many ways. And it's something that I, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I cherish it and kind of really hold true, but yeah, it's been great. Um, I (laughs) was very lucky to have a very supportive family throughout everything and meet some absolutely incredible people kind of along the way and uh you know I'll, I'm, mo- majority of my family is still rooted in El Paso my father still lives there along with my brother who just graduated um two days ago part of this uh quarantine class of 2020 wow um but yeah it was it was great uh you know again like I said I- interesting but it, it's it's where everything started it's home it's kind of how this whole unique journey that I've been going through where it all began and uh, basically where I ended up falling in love with the sport now there are some great teams in El Paso uh, you know Lara came there the great sprinter mm-hmm. uh, is you know and then El Paso what what are some of the te- what was the team you swam for so uh, I swam for a, re- <laughs> a really small club team called West Texas Typhoons. It was abbreviated WET with two Ts. Um, it was a <laughs> club team my 
my father started when I was nine years old. Oh, wow. And okay. yeah, we had a little club team out there and we actually had a pretty good, decent squad. Um, I think kind of coming from it, uh, I, I swam at the university of Texas. We had, uh, my best friends, Maddie Edwards. She swam at Texas A&M. Her sister, uh, swam at Texas for a few years, had to medically retire because of, uh, an injury. And then, uh, my best friend Chase, he ended up swimming at Georgia tech and kind of we, we had a really, really good squad down there, kind of wow. uh, holding down the fort with our little club team. And we all swam Summer League together, too. Oh, I love to hear that. Summer League is where so many of us started and have such great memories and that just kind of where we fell in love with the sport, <laughs> Summer League. Well, well, hats off to your dad for starting that team. And then, you know, so many people went on to swim in college. That's just awesome coming from, you know, not huge, a huge uh, swimming town of El Paso. I mean, I, I've, I'm from Texas, so I know some of the great swimmers and teams that have been in El Paso. Um, you know, the, the Aqua Posse, you know, kind of right. has, has been a strong team forever and ever. Um, well, that's cool that the typhoons, typhoons have done well. Um, so you get, you get pretty fast in, in, in middle school in what was the trend? What was it like in those middle school years and then getting ready for high school and then trying the different cities in high school? Give us a synopsis of all that. Yeah. So I, I think the first time I started doing pretty well, uh, I was 10 years old and, I ended up winning my first state championship in the 200 yard I am, but uh, my first state record actually came in the <laughs> 400 freestyle when I was 10 that summer, which is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> but things the started distance, going. The distance fibers were in there. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I guess so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of when I realized that things maybe could kind of go in a positive way for me with swimming. And yeah, I came middle school, uh, started uh, just consistently performing really well. I think that was kind of the biggest key. You know, at that age, you can still drop time from each meet you go to. And it kind of kept on happening and then kind of realized that I could potentially have a pretty good future in this. And we decided to kind of, you know, the best way to go about pursuing this would try and, uh, re be by relocating somewhere. And ultimately one of my closest friends, um, along with his family was Seth Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, Oh, wow. So he's probably one of my dearest friends, uh, in the entire world. And, uh, one of my biggest role models in life and just oh. always looked up to him. And so they, they're from Midland, Texas. And I come oh, okay. before, before all swimming started for them, they're from <laughs> much smaller towns, but yeah, they swam for city of Midland and they ended up moving to, uh, cops, which is city of Plano swimmers out in Plano, Texas. Yep. That's right. And North Dallas, for those who aren't familiar with it, they they had raving uh, things to say about the team there, the coach there. And we, we looked to them for guidance on what to do, just kind of ultimately following what, what Seth did. And they really recommended uh, the team up there in Plano. And I ended up going to visit I Thanksgiving of, I think it was 2007 or 2008. And I stayed with Seth and his family and worked out with the team. And it was, it was the first time I was kind of thrown in an environment with a club team of that magnitude. And at, at the time they had, uh, one of the best the guys programs, I, th- I think in the whole country. And I had never <laughs> just been used to being around or training around people of that caliber. And I remember like those practices, I was there. Oh my goodness. It was, <laughs> it was eye opening for sure. And, uh, yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll leave off with, with that, or if you want me to continue. Yeah, that's so cool. Seth's a great guy and that's neat that y'all could kind of do that journey together. Um, mm-hmm. so you, how long did you park at, at city of Plano s- swimmers? And then when did you switch down to Austin for, so I was there for, uh, three and a half years and I came to Austin, um, right before the start of my junior year of high school. Okay. Okay. So, so three years in Dallas. Now, would you just go back to El Paso for the holidays and summer stuff? And correct, exactly. Big, big weekend stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, 
and then give us a little snapshot of what you were thinking of why you wanted to move to Austin. Was it because Nitro was kind of blowing up or was it? Uh... I mean, so <clears throat> Nitro had been doing really, really well. They were definitely on the come up. But actually, so there's this whole kind of fiasco that unfolded on our club team with uh, I'm not 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 dogging them in general. But, you know, sometimes I feel like, you know, parent run boards of swim teams, I guess when you get into the political side of things uh our coach's contract was chosen not to be renewed for some reason to this day i still don't know why and i think most of us who swam in that group do not know why and uh basically team kind of dissolved at that point a lot of the guys i trained with all graduated went to college because they were a few years older than me and decided well okay <laughs> maybe it's time to try and rethink and relook at things yeah. And that happens. That happens a lot where, you know, there's just turnover with coaches and, you know, just dynamics shift and, you know, things get rebuilt and, and new, new trajectories. So that's cool. You're able to pivot and go to Austin, which right. and I, you know, I was so young. at I was so young at the time. And again, I, I think the older you get, you finally realize the logistics of how things run behind the scenes when you're kind of in the moment and you're just a swimmer and early high school years you're just like oh it's just a swim team that's it but you have to kind of take a step back and look at how it functions Um, (laughs) i mean but that's for everything it's not just swimming it's it's yeah no yeah yeah. when you grow up you realize there's bills and boards and you know lots of other stuff behind the scenes but um so who did did you go straight to nitro when you when you moved to austin and start just integrating there Correct. And, and what was the name of the high school? Did you represent high school or just club? Uh, just club in Austin. I swam high school in Dallas. Uh, when I when yeah. I was in Austin, um, honestly, I, I moved around <laughs> so much. I didn't really get the chance to. And senior year, uh, I tried swimming high school and <laughs> wasn't able to for some pretty funny reasons. I can kind of get into a little later <laughs> if if you'd like me to. (laughs) Well, sometimes the high school club thing has some drama and goofiness. And sometimes some communities, it works perfect. The coaches communicate, the schedules work out great, and kids can have a wonderful time racing for their high school and racing for their club team. And that's the ideal. That's the goal. That's the dream. Mm -hmm. Then sometimes it doesn't always work that way. You just, just give us a little you know, inside of what happened to you that senior year. Oh boy. So, or if it's, if it's something you can share quickly that we can all learn from, but hopefully it doesn't happen to someone else. No, of course. So I I was at a high school in Cedar park and I was in high school currently with Tate Jackson, uh, who is our school record holder in the hundred yard freestyle. And his brother, who was an All-American in the 200 breaststroke at Notre Dame, but at a high school was a phenomenal 200, 500-yard freestyler. And we all (laughs) – they had moved from Iowa down to Austin, and I had come from Dallas, and we had all wanted to try and be on a high school team together. And we just kind of thought like, hey, we could have some pretty good relays if we do this and stuff too. But we all were not allowed (laughs) – on the high school team just for some silly reasons. I mean, it it was actually supported by our club coach fully. And I don't, I think they may have had a new coach at the time, but, uh, our, our takeaway from that reasoning was because we would take away like relay spots that were kind of planned (laughs) for the upcoming year. And that's what we all were. So, so it was told. It was the high school coach who didn't want to stack you guys together and win titles? Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. That is – yeah, you know, it's it's funny sometimes, you know, um, but whatever. But you anyway, I mean, let's move on. We, yeah, we, go ahead. You know, yeah. ho- hopefully, hopefully uh, we, we learn – you know, coaches can learn from this situation that, you know – it's, yeah. and, it's and usually just, it's the other way around. You, it's it's the disagreement yeah. between the club coaches and the high school coaches. Um, but yeah, it it was kind of primarily coming from the high school side, which usually it comes from the club side. I feel like. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, thanks for sharing that. It's always interesting. Um, so <clears throat> you obviously you you throw down some great club times. Um, 
uh, finishing up high school, getting on the USA junior team. Uh, where did you travel for, with the junior team that year? So we went to Oahu. Ooh, that's nice. Mm-hmm. So oh, who we were else? in Honolulu. What other big names were on that <laughs> USA junior team with you? Ooh, so that's uh, my roommate was Jack Conger um, <laughs> at that meet. That's great. It was great. So yeah, we had Jack Conger, um, Chase Kalish was there. Him and Diaceto were duking it out in the 400 IM <laughs> oh, back at wow. that meet. I mean, that, that rivalry kind of started way prior to 2016, 2015 worlds and everything. Um, but Love yeah, it. I want to say we had them. Gunnar Bentz was there. Uh, we, we were just, just stacked. I mean, Jack Conger was, you know, like, like the guy. Um, I think Ryan Murphy had made a national team event, so wasn't allowed to go. Um, uh, but I mean, oh, okay. of course he, he would have been, I mean, the guy's been qualified at that level since I think he was nine years old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. seems like it, doesn't it? So yeah. Oh, Selskar was on that trip. That's when him and I first got to get to know each other pretty well. Um, yeah, we, we, we had a great crew. Yeah. I think Smoligo was there. Leah Smith. That's- Wow, that's great. I love that because well, I was on the first USA junior team back in 1989. It was the first time oh, wow. the first time USA swimming had gathered the top 16 year old guys and you know, 16, 17 guys and 15, 16 girls. And there was about 30 guys, 30 girls. And they, they took us to Colorado Springs for three days to, to get to bond. And, um, and then a couple months later, we had a meet in Paris and a meet in Germany. And oh, we just had a blast. We raced in Paris, France, ate dinner at the Eiffel Tower. And then the next couple of days, we went to the next World Cup that was held in East Berlin. And it was just a few months after the Berlin Wall had come, had come down. So we actually all ran to the wall and got pieces of the Berlin Wall because it had just came down just a few months before that. It was, oh, it was a, serious? It, yeah, it was incredible. It was incredible. <laughs> food, food was terrible, but it was incredible to be there. <laughs> Because <laughs> East, Ber- East Berlin, you know, even though the wall had come down and they had freedom, it was still stuck in East Berlin mode. You know, it was still so gray and dreary. The food was terrible. People people were nice, but, you know, it was just the stark difference between West Berlin and East Berlin was incredible. It was like passing from, you know, a bright, you know, colored set into black and white. I mean, just oh, when you man, cross, when you cross up, it is, it's, it was so eerie. Um, but anyway, I love the USA junior team. I love what it does for people to kind of, you know, get traveling, get to meet other future USA teammates. And, you know, you get that, you wear that red, white, and blood, red, white, and blue, and it gets in your blood, you know? Oh, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, you're like, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm going to talk about USA stuff later, but so tell us your process of being recruited, how you picked Texas, what other schools were you looking at? Um, anything that Eddie said to you that made the difference little, little stories like that. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, my, my very first recruiting trip was to the university of Notre Dame. Um, it was, uh, I guess back when you can only do unofficials your junior year. Now I feel like kids are taking official recruiting trips as freshmen or something like that. It's, it's crazy <laughs> how far I know. that's progressed, <clears throat> but yeah, it took a visit to, Notre Dame. It was November of 20, 2012. Was it a game weekend? Oh yeah, um, oh, yeah. They, they played Boston College, and it, it oh, was. Oh my incredible. gosh, that was uh, yeah. I I've been to Notre Dame twice on game weekends, and I actually got to go on the field. It is a bucket list thing. I I wish everybody in the universe could just get a glimpse of a game at Notre Dame and a home game. And then if you can go on the field and watch the guys warm up and watch the band walk through it, it really is the coolest thing. Oh yeah. Like, I mean, I, I grew up a, <laughs> a diehard Irish football fan as a kid. And that, that, that was, I, I think still to this day, honestly, probably top of the bucket list for me, that's been checked off. I mean, like you brought that up. I'm just getting chills kind of <laughs> thinking <laughs> you know, about that. You know, you know what I'm talking about. It's awesome. And yeah, my, my dad grew up, uh, I watched, grew up watching my dad love Notre Dame football my whole life mm-hmm. too. And, uh, so yeah, just to be on that campus on a game day, everybody should try it. It's, it's the coolest. So oh, it's incredible. Like, I, 
we got to go see the trumpets under the dome. Um, that that's that's so surreal, and yeah, they did a great job. I was actually on that trip uh, with Ryan Murphy too. Uh, he went up oh. to go visit his brother, who was uh, on the team currently. So he made an unofficial um, out of it as well. I mean, we we had a great time. Uh, they did a great job hosting us, and yeah, still to this day I have such a sweet spot for them. Yeah, and Tim Welsh is one of the superhuman beings on the planet, and. Oh, uh, yeah. Love that man and uh, all he's done for coaching and uh, and for Notre Dame. Unbelievable. So uh, what, what, what? any other schools you looked at? Yeah, so went from there. Uh, and basically, so my, my official started off, I guess, in order. I went to Cal, USC, Georgia, Wisconsin, and then uh, saved Texas for last. It, I, Lo- loved all of them. Uh, I, I think the biggest eye opener to me out of all of them was University of Wisconsin. I actually really, really enjoyed it uh, over there. It, it was funny. I, <laughs> I think my trip was early October, and I, for some reason, I think it was still probably in the so perf- perfect low weather. Nin- <laughs> yeah, it was, well, it was low nineties in Texas, and I think my just greatly knowledge high school mind thought that it's going to be the same everywhere else I go because it's, it's early <laughs> October. It can't be cold anywhere else. Like, come on. And then, uh, I think it was like 32 degrees on kickoff with, uh, I think the wind was blowing 15, 20 miles an hour. <laughs> 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 and I packed only uh, shorts and sh- t-shirts. <laughs> oh no. Oh no. Well, oh yeah. Hopefully, some of those guys gave you a jacket or a parka or something. Yeah, uh, I, I had great hosts who uh, gave me like hockey jackets, hoodies. They they decked me out. <laughs> oh, good, good. Yeah, no, Wisconsin's a cool campus. It's mm-hmm. uh, you know, the, the, p- people say it's kind of like the, the the Austin of Wisconsin is is Madison and um, very similar towns and cool campuses and fun football games and but. Um, yeah, so so you you checked out Georgia, checked out SC, checked out Cal, and then uh, why did Texas? What what kind of did it for you? You know, I mean, <clears throat> I, I think you can attest to it. Um, you know, growing up in the state of Texas, I mean, did you grow up swimming at uh, the TSC? As, yeah, as to go to, to go to to go to Austin for the state champs was yeah. the coolest thing ever as a kid in Texas. For sure, and. Uh, Ditto on that. Um, you know, it, I think my first time swimming there, I was nine years old, and I just remember just walking in, and <laughs> you just walk into this huge monstrosity <laughs> of a swim center that you're just not used to. I mean, like, dude, I'm used to the tiny little pools in El Paso that uh, just don't really hold a lot, and then just kind of from there, you go into probably, arguably, one of the top two pools in the world. Um, <laughs> And it's, it's just, wow, I, I didn't even know how to take it all in. I mean, I still don't even think I saw the whole place when I was nine because it was just so big. But uh, kind of from there there on, I, I'd go there a couple times a year for swim meets. And then you, you see those banners hanging. You see the record board on deck. And then you if you're lucky enough, you can sometimes catch a glimpse of Eddie or Chris on the pool deck at some meet, or if you get there and they're just finishing up practice. And I don't know, I think it's just all that combined with just the, the culture and the tradition that Eddie and Chris, you know, developed at the university of Texas and just kind of sitting down and talking it over with my dad and ultimately decided that, Hey, I mean, this has been <clears throat> a goal of mine since I was a little kid was to come swim for them. And I, I wasn't even sure if Eddie was going to be around long enough for me to swim for him in college. And <laughs> <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> he was, you know, I feel like so many coaches have used that recruiting excuse of, Oh, Eddie's not going to be there for all your four years, blah, blah, blah. They've, and like, they've been saying that for 20 years. You know exactly, and I mean, I'm going into my eighth year next year with him, and he's still here. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, I love it. Well, yeah, I, I totally get it. Growing up in Texas, getting to you know say hi to Eddie and Chris on the deck, you know, when you're in high school and they recognize you and say hi to you, you're like, oh boy, this is good. And then you you train in that pool every day with those guys, and to see those names on the record board, it is it is a dream come true. And so we're glad you you came to Texas, and so. You immediately start getting in it. You know how hard it is. We train hard every day. Um, mm-hmm. the, the usual formula, nine, ten swims a week, 
three lifts a week, two dry lands. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just every day's hard. And, uh, but Eddie's so, so good at reading us and, you know, it's hard, but, but yet he, he works with us so that we don't go too far in the hole. And, um, and we kind of exactly. save the best, save the best for the end of the season. And, you know, your freshman year, you did good getting, <clears throat> getting consoles in your events at NC2As and, you know, conference was good. NC two A's was was good for a freshman. What give any insights about your freshman year? Things that were, you know, that you learned, or things that you know maybe you didn't do well that got you fired up to to fix for your sophomore year. Anything like any like that for your freshman year? Yeah, uh, I, I thought freshman year went great. Uh, it, it was the first time where I kind of started to realize that, you know, I. I think I belong at this level of swimming. And I remember like the first, uh, the first U S nationals that I went to, it was in Palo Alto. I think it was 2015. Um, no, it wasn't 2015. It was way before then. I can't remember, but I just like that first nationals I went to, I you know, in the back of my mind, I, I was just really nervous and I just felt like I never really belonged at, at that stage of swimming yet. And Getting to college, um, kind of a- after that first NCAA's, it kind of made me realize, like, I, I started kind of like truly kind of believing that and believing that I belonged at this. I can compete with some of the best of the best. I I, I had made uh, had consoles in the 200 IM, 200 breaststroke. I think I was 13th and 14th um, mm-hmm. overall, right. respectively. And then 400 IM actually ended up doing pretty well. Uh, that was. Uh, my first A final, I think I was fifth overall in that and kind of touched the wall. was like, oh, whoops. <laughs> um, That's great. Maybe that should have been the worst placing event to where if I have to keep this in my arsenal or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no hiding, no hiding. You're good at the 400 I am now. So, <laughs> yeah. That's so and, funny. Were you, did, did you think you had it in you to break a school record as a freshman? To be honest, no, <laughs> not at all. I mean, I didn't even notice I broke the record until uh, I think uh, Tim came and told me, or Travis came and told me after the race. So I had no idea. And actually, I looked up in the stands, and my dad was pointing at something, and I had no idea what he was pointing at. And I guess it was that. So yeah, I had no idea going into it or this season at all. But it, it, it was good. It, it, it was very nerve wracking, um, just kind of having your first national championships at your home pool. And kind of all the pressure that comes along with that. And, you know, we had a really, really, really talented freshman class uh, last year with Drew Kibler and all those guys coming in. And they kind of went through the same thing of having their first national championships in Austin. And we kind of told them leading up to it, like, just try and relax. Like, I I, I can guarantee you there's going to be a lot of stress and a lot of pressure with just the expectations of, you know, what it means kind of having this on your home turf and um, not to sound biased or anything, but I mean, I feel like having it at Texas is it's, it's the prime thing you can do. And to be thrust into that spot as a freshman is it, it's pretty nerve wracking. I, I, I know, I think Jack Conger uh, just put a ton of pressure on himself yeah. our first year to succeed. And I don't think had the meat he wanted. I mean, he all American in all of his events, um, but I, just, just for him, I mean, he's such an elite caliber swimmer. I mean, that guy's expecting, you know, kind of, I would say <laughs> if I'm him second place at worst, but yeah, uh, it, it was a great meet though. I uh, learned a ton from it and I, I think it just helped me build a whole lot of momentum going forward. What, what was the final team standings that freshman year, 2014? I want to say Cal beat us by like 52 points. I, I think okay, we so, had so, a... Yeah, they beat us pretty good. Yeah, I remember that. I, I was there for that, and I. Uh, it is tough when when they edge us at home. It's not fun, and um, but that f- puts a lot of fuel in the fire for the next year, and and you kill it. And this is where I want to get into some epic races you've you've had your sophomore, junior, senior year. Um, they're just <laughs> they're just <laughs> crazy. Um, you know, the, your sophomore year, you you have your epic race with Kevin Cordes and everybody thinks Kevin's going to win and, and you touched him out. And so that was a big deal. And then 400, I 400, I am, if you remember that, do you, 
Let's go through these sophomore, junior, seniors, if you can remember some of these moments. Yeah, definitely. Um, so <laughs> I, I'd still say to this day, uh, that that's the best uh, swim meet I, I've ever had in my life. Um, kind of what I was going on to, you know, freshman year NCs being the first time I kind of started to realize that I could possibly belong at this stage. And sophomore year was the first time I believed that, you know, I, I do belong. And I think it's the first time that uh, it really made that the goals that I have a legitimate possibility kind of in my mind. Cause you know, as a kid, like you have all these things you want to do, but they're just kind of goals and thoughts out there. But when you finally start to realize like, Oh crap, I could potentially actually accomplish these. Um, that that was the first time and let's see I, I think uh you know one of the best races i've ever had was actually my 200 im there and i got second to david nolan um, yeah that's what i was gonna say so you, you took on nolan in the 200 im and yeah. you know he was the was i guess he, did he have the american record by then or did you guys, uh, who, uh i, I think, think you guys Lo- both lochte lochte had it yeah lochte so you guys both you both you both went under it but he touched you out like right. Or, uh, yeah. So Lochte was like 40.0 something. I think I ended up getting under it by 0.02 or something, but it, it, Nolan just blasted in when I like, 39 low. That's <laughs> right. That's right. Kind yeah. of ridiculous. Yes, and, that's right. But, but for you to go 40.0 is still huge and get the go under the yeah. American record, but get second was just incredible swim. Incredible. Um, so yeah, I, I love how you say, I, I finally believed that I could do that. And that kind of gave you the confidence to attack those races and take on Nolan in the 200 IM and Kevin Cordes in the 200 breast and, you know, Chase Kalish in the 400 IM. I mean, just incredible stuff. And so your junior year, you, you finally win the 200 IM because Nolan's gone. You dominate. And then Kevin's gone. So you dominate the two breasts with a 148.1. Were you, were you shocked by the 148.1? I mean, that's a big drop for, to your junior year. Honestly, uh, not, I guess I wouldn't say shocked. I think it was more just kind of thrilled um it, it had been a goal of mine to try and see how how close i could come to that and i i'll say straight up i i still to di- to this day think that uh when kevin went 148.6 um for the first time I, I still think that's on par with any of the greatest swims to ever be swam in the, in the history of the sport just given where things were at the moment he did that uh, I, I think people fail to realize like no one else had been under a minute 51 seconds in the 200 brush stroke before Kevin. And he, he took that all the way down to <laughs> a minute, minute 48. And again, it's not that like there were people still like not really going under a minute 54 seconds when he did that. I, I mean, like there were, there were a couple, but it's not like now where, I mean, there, there are just probably six people at a minute 51 or better in the a final of NC's. Yeah, and Ke- Kevin doing that is still, I, I think, one of the most remarkable swims of all time. And uh, after the sophomore year, I, I got pretty close to it and kind of thought, you know, maybe. I mean, just put together a really, really good year of training, and with it being Olympic year coming up, just try and see how close you can get to it. And I, I thought I had a pretty good chance um, of taking a shot at it. Yeah, well, you're right in saying Kevin Cordes is the Roger Bannister of breaststroke. I mean, just a huge barrier breaker, you know, 150, 149, then finally 148. And, but that kind of made it seem like it's humanly possible for someone like yourself to do it as well. What are some of the sets? Do you remember any of the sets Eddie gave you? Cause I mean, to, to go out in 24 and then 27, you're out in 51, you know, or 52 low in a 200 breast. Like, give me a break. That's insane. And then you come back another 26, another 27, <laughs> I mean, how do you, you know, 27, 27, coming home in a 54, 55. I mean, it's incredible. What, what are some of the sets that, uh, that you can think of that come to mind? You know, honestly, I, I think so, so much of that is just all the racing we do throughout the year and just that, uh, you, you know, the Texas tough mentality. Um, it, it's what we do in September. It's what we do in October. It's what we do in November. And it, it's just kind of everything leading up to that point. Um, I, I know I had 
made it a point to try and get a whole lot better at my underwaters. Uh, my kind of during my freshman year, um, and I, I don't I don't know if there's really anything in specific. Uh, some sets. I mean, I, I I have plenty of you kind of throughout that time frame. I don't know if they exactly kind of like particularly took place during that year. Um. I, I know one thing we do a lot of are 300 yard breaststrokes and those, those are horrible, especially short course, just how many turns you have and all the underwaters you have to do. I mean, you're, you're dizzy after those. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, the, so pretty threshold 300s breaststroke makes a 200 seem easy, I guess. So. Yeah, exactly. And honestly, like, like for me, primarily, uh, I, I didn't train with our breaststroke group um, as, as much as the rest of the breaststrokers at Texas, uh, I was doing, um, contrary to belief, I feel like a lot of people don't think I train a lot of, I am, um, I, I, I do. And I would say primarily like the bulk of my training is freestyle and, you know, training with Jack Conger and Joe schooling. I mean, they were the two guys next to me in practice every day and just kind of duking it out with those guys racing them constantly like i know i'm not racing them in breaststroke but i mean shoot i'm just a, am just a breaststroke or swimming freestyler swimming freestyle trying to keep up with chet kong and <laughs> joe schooling every day so um it made Sorry. breaststroke a little easier for me <laughs> oh that's great i love that that is the cool thing about texas you just try and keep up with the guys next to you you know you're you're on you're on par for good things um so i'm curious your junior year 2016 you win the 200 im win the 200 breast 148 one um, you know break the american record who'd you who'd you get second to in the 400 im uh prino oh okay so some epic battles with him yeah um yeah, he went then, i think the 335 he, he had a great race Oh, wow. That's right. I remember that now. And so now your now you're senior year, 2017, it kind of all comes together. Um, you win, you finally win the Turner I am, of course, the Turner breast going to Epic 147.9. And you decided to switch to the Hunter breast instead of the 400 I am. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Correct. All right. Uh, mutual decision between Eddie and myself. <laughs> Yeah, and I I do want to say you've had some epic battles with Chase Kalish too in that in the 400 I am uh, over the years too. So um, that 200 breast going 147.9, and you, you know you got so many. First of all, you got a lot of points to help the team win in 15, 16, 17. Can you tell us about that run and how important the yeah. team team points uh, were? So going into team points, that that was ultimately the decision, um, the deciding factor to switch to the 100 breaststroke my last year. Uh, we'd had a couple of guys already who were all potential scorers and potentially a, a final swims in the 400 IM, but we had no other breaststrokers qualified in the 100. And just to kind of balance those points out, uh, we just thought it would just be best served if I did the 100 instead of the 400 IM because we would have had uh, three, potentially four guys swimming night swims in that versus zero in the 100 breaststroke yeah, and just kind of tried to combat that. Um, that but it, it it was great. I actually didn't realize how close of a race it was till afterwards. I mean, I, I had touched and saw, I got my hand on the wall first, but I think I remember walking back over um, to our area and people being like, Man, you gave us a heart attack there. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> I mean, I, I had no idea. I mean, I don't really look when I swim. I mean, I can kind of see where people are on a turn, but um, Fabian from Missouri apparently, I think, had me up until almost the flags, and yep. it almost went down to the touch, which I, I I had no idea. And then it kind of got my heart jumping a little bit watching the race. I was like, oh man, <laughs> that's cool. My, I my mean, first the hundred 100... wasn't great. The 100 breast is hard to win. 50 point mid usually does the job, but it's but there's a lot of guys right there. So mm-hmm. so real quick, the, the the three days of your senior year were pretty epic. So 200 IM, you get first with a great time, and then an hour later you do a breaststroke split that you guys crush the American record in the foreigner medley relay. Mm-hmm. First medley relay to go under three minutes. You basically went 259, mm-hmm. which is what most 400 free relayers wish they could go. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you do you remember your split on that medley relay? 
Oh yeah, I was forty nine six, forty nine seven, I believe. Uh, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Thanks. I then, mean, it, 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 th- those were actually my my favorite uh, college memories. Were those four hundred medley relays? I mean, but bar none, like by far, like not not even close. Yeah, because yeah, I mean, you got you you handed off to schooling. And then he, you know, he ends it off to Conger and I mean, just what a, what a joy it's gotta be. It's gotta be a rush. Um, second night you win the hundred breast and you get the American and in- institute record in the 200 medley relay, which is cool. Do the sprint relay. And then the right. third night, third night you crush the, uh, breaststroke American record. First man to break 148, you go 147.9, still the existing American record. You're averaging like, you know, five strokes a lap. I mean, give me a break, uh, uh, going 147, <laughs> which is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of freestylers wish they could go. So let, you go 24, two first 50, 27, one, 27, nine, 28, five, you're out 51, four at the middle, just go, Oof. just cruising five, five to six, five to six strokes per lap. Can you just tell us what you're thinking about so that maybe we can, because so few of us will ever understand what that feels like to take five or six strokes a lap, going out in 51, making it look so easy. What, what are you thinking about? Well, I, I knew if I wanted to have a shot of just going faster than the year before, I had to be out fast. I mean, I was out, I think, 51-8 my, my junior year. And I mean, I, I just remember how, how bad that felt on the home stretch <laughs> coming home <laughs> and just realizing that if I wanted to better that, I mean, shoot, I have to go out even faster. And it's just something you try not to think about a whole lot kind of leading up to it. And you just have to embrace the fact that it's going to hurt regardless what you do yeah. and just straight up kind of send it. But also it, it's taking it out quick while also being patient. Uh, if, if that makes sense. I mean, still, yeah, because you, 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 you don't rush your stroke. I mean, it's very right. purposeful. It's very extended. Your arms are catching everything. Your legs are catching everything. So the timing is there. You never look rushed, but obviously it's aggressive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that's kind of how Eddie, Eddie preaches things. Um, you know, it, he'd much rather you go, say, in a 200 freestyle. He'd much rather you go um a 132 taking it out at a 42 rather than going a 131 but you take it out of 45 um he, he he just wants to see you kind of go for it and give that effort from the beginning and that's just kind of how i've been kind of taught to swim that since i've been in texas and it's just what i've done it's the way i've trained kind of for it um it's definitely a way that you you can't swim a 200 meter breaststroke like that you'll just crumble to pieces <laughs> um but it yeah, just honestly kind of going for it from the get go, but also being smart about it, if that makes sense. Like I said, you, you can't rush. I mean, if you do, you, you just have no chance, and that race is just going to beat you every single time. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I love getting to call your races throughout the conference meets every February throughout your career. And obviously, you could tell the workload you had put in to handle a 400 IM, 200 breast, um, you know, 200 IM weekend, and you know, consistently bring those great swims, uh, especially at conference when you're still kind of tired. Um, so I, I just appreciate the work, your work ethic, and your your ability to stay tough. Um, is there something that some of the coaches along your way or Eddie Reese said to you over the years that really meant a lot. Any, any little conversations or any little locker room wisdom, you know, from all those great locker room meetings and jokes and stories, anything stand out to you? Man, there's so many. Um, I, I can honestly kind of go back to, uh, so when, when I moved to nitro, uh, we, we were definitely built off. It, it was primarily like a 200, 500 free base program. Let's touch 400 IM. I mean, it, it was really, really hard. Like that was, uh, it, it taught me how to just push yourself kind of constantly and just deal with some pretty miserable sets. And it really helps a lot being at Texas. And there's a lot of times, you know, when you hit that October, November time frame where you just feel like the biggest piece of trash on the planet <laughs> i mean <laughs> i think the last thing you want to do is just stand at the edge of the pool at 
you know, like 5.58 a.m. just looking at that water you're about to jump in when you're already exhausted and it's Tuesday morning or Wednesday <laughs> morning. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> but it, it, I think it, it's just during those times where you're exhausted but keep keep pushing and it's, it's that self-growth that occurs. And I, I don't know. I, I think it's not really something Eddie said, but kind of how he handles it. Um, it, it's, it's kind of cool, you know, and if we're doing repeat hundred freestyles on it, just like a straight up, just chill aerobic day. And we had been working hard throughout the week and say it's a Thursday and Eddie gives us hundred freestyles and says, don't go faster than 56, please. For the love of whatever you do, just don't go faster than 56. Just take this moment and just do what I tell you and just try to relax a little bit. Yeah. And you have so many guys around you who are so competitive and they're like, well, these guys are going 56s. I can go 55s and still beat them. Then the guy next to them <laughs> sees him do that. And he's like, well, I'm going to have to go 54 to beat him. And it, yeah, it causes the worst chain reaction. And Eddie just laughs at it. And like he, he'll, he'll never tell us to kind of chill. I mean, most of the time, he'll, he'll just kind of let us be. And I think it's just what truly kind of makes everyone so special is just how much we love racing each other, but also ultimately just kind of you know, love each other. And that goes into a quote that Eddie kind of says, I, I don't know if it's come, if it came from, if he got it from somewhere else or it's just solely from him, but uh, it says, uh, take care of yourself, take care of each other and the rest will take care of itself. And I, yeah. I don't know, that, that's kind of something I've always held on kind of what, what he's said and just ultimately uh, you're doing it for the person next to you kind yeah. of, and just realizing that, you know, just something as simple as the energy you bring to practice every day can have a pretty good effect on the person next to you. And uh, we, we've had two guys the last five years who have been phenomenal with that. It's <laughs> Ryan Hardy and John Shebbett, I think, are two of the highest energy people I've ever met. I'm sure you can attest to that. <laughs> yeah, they're um, great guys. They're the only people I know who are cracking jokes, laughing and yelling at 6 a.m. while everyone's just still <laughs> half asleep. And I'm just saying the meanest things in my head to them, like not out loud, but in my head, just like, dude, just please, please stop. Be quiet. Like, it's too early for this. How do you have that much energy? Uh, I love but it. it. It draws more out of you, though. I mean, uh, it, it's. I mean, it, it's hard to explain kind of looking from the outside into it. Um I think it's a lot easier if you're kind of on the inside explaining it. Um, But it's, it's just truly the culture that him and Chris have developed over the years. And cubic was such a big part to my swimming career. Uh, And I I miss him dearly. And (laughs) I think one of the saddest days of my life was the day he announced his retirement. And a lot of people, I think don't realize like the impact he's had on this program as well, uh, along with Eddie Reese and just knowing how, how much those two complemented each other. No, there's no doubt about it. I mean, arguably one of the greatest coaches in the, in the world, but he was assistant to Eddie all those years. And, um, right. Yeah. Huge, huge impact for sure. Um, I was blessed to get to swim with Eddie and Chris for 14 years and just loved oh, every, wow. every, every day of it, loved every day of it. And, and you're right. It's hard to explain to people the culture. And, but once you're there, you, and you, you, you feel it you know, the positive impact that you can have on others. And that's one of the habits of an ultimate swimmer is serving others and making sure you take care of the people around you while you take care of yourself and good things happen. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Yeah, of course. So just to kind of round things out with your career, you know, you kind of spent 2018 just kind of cruising and, you know, navigating life outside the Texas team and kind of getting into the pro, dipping your foot in the pro circles. And then 2019, you, you nailed it at Pan Am's going your lifetime best in the 200 breast 2076 and 200 IM 159.1. So did you have a good time in Lima, Peru at, uh, at that USA Pan American meet? Yeah, um, we we had a really really good group of people on the team. Uh, probably wasn't the funnest competition, just given. I mean, there were quite a few illnesses that that happened throughout there. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot of um, international experience in that regard yet. Um, but it, it was good though. I mean, I. I roomed with Kevin Cortez in Lima and we had a blast. Again, I, I love that dude to death. He's 
meant so much to my swimming career, but also had Gunnar Bentz in the suite next to us. And he's also one of my closest friends in the sport. And I mean, shoot with just with those two, I mean, we, we had a blast, but it, it was good. Um, I Lima did such a good job of setting it up and just made it truly feel like it was just this incredible, amazing sporting event. And oh, it's cool. It, it was just so easy to get up for it and swim fast. But yeah, I, I thought things went well. Um, finally ended up uh, beating my 2016 trials time, which had taken a while. And it's it's kind of funny, you know, a lot, a lot of little kids ask there because, like I was saying, it when you're a little kid, I mean, you're you're going meet to meet dropping times, and <laughs> then you kind of make them realize, like, hey, just let you know, like, if you didn't go best time this year, it, it sucks. I know, but it happens. I mean, I almost went four years in my best event. Yep. Um, w- without dropping, it's it's a tough, brutal sport. You gotta love it because you can go, you do all that work, four to five hours a day, and maybe you drop a tenth, and maybe you don't drop for three or four years, and uh, it's it is tough. You gotta love it. Um, but I, we love watching you swim, man. I love watching you swim, and you, you inspire a lot of people. And I just would like to close with a little lightning round of your favorite things. Oh, um, love it. F- favorite color? Oof, uh, I would I have to go with blue. Um, but if it comes to clothing, white. Oh, cool. Uh, favorite food? Uh, not, you can't beat a good like medium rare rare ribeye steak with mac and cheese. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the best combo on the planet. I'm sorry. Like, no, if you no, disagree, then anyone else no, is wrong. No, that, that that is that is that is pretty special stuff. But Austin's such a foodie town. Do you have a kind of a go to place that y'all they'll hit after practice or something? So the team we have this little breakfast taco place, uh, pretty much right at the edge of campus, uh, by North Campus called Taco Joint and. Uh, I think the amount of business we have given that place in the last <laughs> five, six years, we should get free tacos for life. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Fa- do you have a favorite dessert or a little sweet something? Ooh, or, or do you, are you, are you, are you, do you not do that? I, I would have to say, I think my favorite dessert, I mean, growing up, I used to love cheesecake to death, but I think pecan pie, like Thanksgiving time, it, oh, it's hard to beat. <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. Um, favorite. Favorite city you like to visit or travel to? Uh, so, oh man, okay, sorry, a little something. I'll, I'll get this. So, I, I actually I loved Hawaii when I went there for Junior Pan Packs. I thought it was incredible, uh, one of the most beautiful places I've seen. I also love. Uh, my mom lives up in Nashville, Tennessee, and oh, I, yeah. I actually love Nashville to death. Um, it's, it's just a beautiful town with even just the people there they're just the nicest human beings on the planet yeah it is it's a very cool happening town for sure and, mm-hmm. and yeah and I, i'm with you i love hawaii too um favorite pool you've ever raced in or swam in Oof, i'm gonna be a homebody and say texas yeah. i mean outside texas i think olympic trials is such a special experience i mean that that's also pretty neat in itself yeah no don't doubt but Texas is hard to beat, especially when we get, we get to train in it all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, well, Will, I just love that we got to know you a little bit more, and uh, I appreciate what you've done for Texas and USA and represented El Paso great, and, and we're going to be cheering you on this next year. Are you going to stick it out and train for uh, Trials 21? Oh, yeah, no doubt about that. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, you got a bunch of new fans now, and uh, thank you for being an ultimate swimmer that you not only take care of yourself, but you take care of others and, and you take care of business in the pool. So, so we love watching you and thanks for being on the show and we'll wish you all the best this next year. Yeah, of course. You know, thank you so much for having me. This, this was awesome. And, uh, again, I say all the time, like you, you're the one that kind of started this. We're just following in, you know, your, your footsteps and y- y'all paved the way for us here at, at Texas and y'all on the national team. I mean, y- y'all set the example of, what it means to represent, you know, us, University of Texas, and as well as United States of America. So, I mean, thank, thank you. I mean, we, we learned it from y'all. Uh, I love it. I love it. I'm standing on the shoulders of some guys before me, you know, Sean Jordan, Doug Jertson, and, and many others. But um, I can't wait to see you around the pool soon. Thanks, Will. Yes, sir. Likewise. Y'all have a good one. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. 
Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your Ultimate Swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.